Hi there, good evening and uh, welcome to um, Fantastic Complete Dentures. So that's what I'm going to be talking about this evening is um, all aspects of complete dentures. So I'm just getting my mouse to work there, that's good. And just make sure my pointer's working, which is great, lovely. So just as usual, um, I'm going to just do the presentation. It'll be around about an hour. And as we're going along, please just put your questions into chat and I will look at them and um, I will, uh, I'll just put my video on, just notice that my video was switched off. Um, put your questions into chat and I'll um, answer them right at the end. I'll go through them and we'll spend about half an hour doing that. So that's really good. Now, one question that people do ask quite a lot of the time is, Finn, why do you just do dentures? And, uh, well, the main reason is I love doing them. And, um, and there's reasons for that is that I'm better at dentures than other things that I've done in dentistry. Um, and that's because I've had such good mentors like Fraser McCord and uh, latterly John Besford and lots of other really important people along the way. And secondly, which is very, very important, I think, is that I've got a great technician and I've worked with Rowan for um, over 20 years now. Um, and he's a brilliant technician at removable pros. So these are the two things that really um, uh, are the reasons why. Now, when I set up my referral practice 13 years ago, though, I took in both referrals for fixed and removable prosthodontics. And I found I got my fingers burnt, I had many more problems with fixed prosthodontics than re with removable. And I just want to share with you the last fixed case that it was the, the last straw that broke the camel's back with me. And here he is, Mr. D, the disaster destroyer, the Bruxist, completely. And um, he came to see me and he'd actually been to see and had four different really really good dentists uh, treat him in the past. There was three specialists and another dentist, a fourth dentist who was excellent um, at dealing with implants with great experience. So he'd seen those four dentists and, and not got on with them at all. And in fact, he'd taken legal action against those previous dentists. And this is, this is what his mouth was like when he presented. So, so he had a screw retained hybrid bridge at the top there. So that's like a screw in metal reinforced denture. And then in the low, he's got a uh, ceramic. So it's porcelain work on lots of implants and also two remaining teeth there. So let's have a look in his mouth when he actually turned up. And I thought flipping egg, I looked in his mouth and I thought, gosh, we can, we can improve on this, definitely. Anyway, so now what this chap wanted, he said, look, I want, I want an improvement in the aesthetics. I don't like the look of these things. They keep breaking. I want to have porcelain teeth, please, Finlay, in the upper arch. So now, so I thought about this um, and I thought, yeah, we can do this. I thought this would be the solution for him. This is a Whirly Bridge here, which is it's, it's actually designed, developed by Peter Whirly in California. And it's a bar that gets screwed onto the implants. And then on top of that bar, we have um, their crowns that are fitted onto it, just like normal porcelain bonded to metal crowns. Um, and then if one of those chips, say we have a Bruxist patient like this, Mr. D here, who's a heavy Bruxist, you can see he had big jowls and cheeks. 
then if they crack, we can actually undo one and replace it and, and off we go. Um, so it's future proof. Finn, you idiot doing this. You know, I was, what was I doing and thinking about? I was, first of all, he sued all of these excellent dentists in the past, four of them. So what am I, how am I going to be any better than that? Number one. Number two, I'm actually use, doing a new system, something I've never done before, this Whirly Bridge, first time I've ever done it. And thirdly, I was using a different technician that I normally use because I normally have Rowan in the room next door to me. And I was using a different technician, a really great technician, but someone that I'd never worked with before. So this is total hubris, you idiot. So here we go. So this is my first go at doing this case. Okay, so look at that. He's a Bruxist. Snapping porcelain off here. We've got these, this is staining. He's not great at brushing. Also, he was unhappy with the aesthetics. You know, if you look at the upper left teeth there, the, that lateral incisor and canine compared to the upper right, it was shorter. So we thought, let's try again. We'll move on. So I know someone's put their hand up. Wigger Tasman from, uh, from Switzerland. Hi, hi there. Um, I'm going to answer all the questions at the end, uh, Wigger. So you can just type in, type away. It's fine. Um, now, this is my second go here uh, for, for, for treating this chap. And this looked better, but it was not, he wasn't able to clean it at all underneath here because this is just such a long, horrible flange on this fixed upper beam. And then um, secondly, the, the bridge we'd made it narrower than the first one and knowing he's a bruxist and he's also got his big tongue he'd started to bite his tongue to bits so i was getting really desperate at this point not knowing what to do and i knew we had to make another bridge and by this stage we had these teeth available which were shotlander enigma life teeth the the really beautiful looking teeth um but they're still dentured teeth. You know, the anterior is a composite and the posterior, the anterior is a acrylic, the posterior is a composite. They're still dentured teeth. But I said to the patient, look, I think we should do you another hybrid, but with these beautiful teeth. And instead of us making just one upper, we'll make two. So you've got two lots of upper teeth. So when one lot wear down, we can take that off get the other set out of the box, fit the other set, and then off you go. And we can refurbish your first set and have it ready for you when you wear out the other. So, so that's what we agreed to do, and that's what we did. So here's our third attempt here to go. And, and I was much more comfortable with this. I felt this was a much better arrangement. Anyway, this is about two years of the treatment. He'd spent, um, he spent £30,000. That was my original quote for the whole thing. So it's £30,000. I had three goes. Off he went. And then I got a letter from him, an email saying, I'm not happy. I've got a little bit of cheek biting. Not happy about this. But the main thing I'm not happy about is you've given me these denture teeth that are very cheap compared to ceramic teeth. and um, I want porcelain teeth. But by this stage, I was just over, I'd, I was over him. I couldn't bear him coming into the surgery anymore. Um, and um, so uh, I, I spoke with a defense organization and they said, look, Finn, it's that it, you offered him. The original plan was porcelain teeth. You've given him acrylic. It's not what he wanted. You have to refund the full amount to him if you're not prepared to see him again so so that's what i did and actually i felt like a failure and i really hate it when things don't work but this was like a turning point for me and so i felt really down actually about it and it it took i took a week off work because i just felt really stressed about 
the work that I was doing. And Rachel and I, we talked about it and we decided that I should talk to a clinical psychologist who specializes in work-related stress. And so back in 2014, I went to see John, who, who's based in Lancaster here. He's a lovely chap. And it was amazing. It was wonderful. The second visit that I had with him, he recommended to me to buy this book here, which is Mindfulness. And um, it is a, it's basically Mindfulness Cognitive Behaviour Therapy. If you've got any sort of interest in, in this area of, of um, dealing with these difficult problems, then I'd highly recommend that book there. Take a screenshot of it. Uh, just now and order it and now because we're in lockdown it's a perfect time for for looking at this and actually having a go at doing this it's brilliant the other thing that john actually recommended was finn do you not have peers to talk to about these very difficult patients that you treat um, and i said no i don't talk about my failures to anybody i just keep it in and and just uh, carry on and but I thought about this and I thought, gosh, I've got a ready-made peer support group, which is the Bestford Study Club. And we've been together now for 10 years. It's a small group in Britain. We love dentures and we support each other. And I can actually go and talk about these cases with them. So I presented Mr. D years ago to the group and it was just so cathartic. It was wonderful. And I think as a global uh, dental community we should be like this there's lots of groups where we can all get together and talk about these issues so in a nutshell that's that's why i don't do fixed pros i love removable so what i'm going to talk about today here in the presentation is um uh, complete dentures and this is my set routine for vi numbers of visits it takes five visits to, to make the dentures and then number six is a is a review and generally i'll have three or four reviews for my complete denture patients necessary so and what i'm trying to do here is to i want to develop shapes of the dentures that fit into the mouth and stay as still as possible during function. So in other words, these fitting surfaces and the polished surfaces allow the dentures to just remain as stable as possible when the patient's laughing, talking, eating, socializing, you know, you name it. So just gonna stay in place. And the basic principle is it's all about the impression. I'm just going to take David's lower denture out here. This is a full lower denture, it's not on implants. So that had great suction on it. Um, I've put 20% on the screen there because we only get, I only get suction on 20% of full lowers. 80% I don't. But the system that I use, which has been developed by Dr. Abe in Japan in Tokyo, and this is Rowan and me visiting them years ago. Um, we went to visit in 2014 and we learned from uh, Dr. Abe this technique and it was terrific. Uh, so I get suction on 20% of the cases, but 80% not, but the these additional benefits from this system means that it's so stable and so i get better results since since i've been doing this it's terrific he's written a great book on this and i would highly recommend it so and actually he's doing some free webinars um on um facebook uh, i think it's monday wednesday and the following monday it's a good book so that's another good book for the lockdown there haynes manual to it so, but I'll talk to you. I've used this system that Dr. Arbe advocates. I've used it and I've actually adapted it to the way that I work and the materials that I love using. So, first of all, I want to talk about the impressions. So, visit one and two. So, 
if we if you imagine we have a patient for a complete set of dentures and that this is visit one for them for treatment this is what i use it's a it's, it's a stock tray designed by dr arbe which is called a frame cut back tray because these back bits are cut out to allow the retromolar pad to stick through just here like that and then we've got a little flange here that runs into the retromylohyoid area so now we take an impression in this which is made of alginate here this is a little video just showing what the actual impression looks like after we've done it and we've got both a thin mix which is blue which goes into a syringe. This is a monojack syringe, 35 milliliter. And then we've got a thick bit, which is the white material in this impression, goes into the tray. I'll show you how we do that and use it together. This is the material that I'm using now to do this, which is tropicalgin, which is a base material that goes into the, into the stock tray. And then neocolloid goes into the syringe. So, and this is the key, ACE impression, and it's really predictable, it's brilliant. So we've got here, Claire, my nurse, is mixing up the material to go into the syringe, just there. I'm mixing my alginate to, to go into the stock tray, here. We've got Mary sitting in the chair, just there, the patient ready to have the impression done. I'll say to Mary, now have a swallow, please, and just clear your mouth of any saliva. Claire loads the syringe, so it's free of air bubbles, and I load the tray with this thick alginate material. And what I'm doing is I'm thinking about, I'm visualizing her mouth and where I want the impression material to go. It's quite thick, this base. It holds itself really nicely, this base impression material. So once I've loaded the tray, I run water, running water onto my fingers and I glaze the impression surface, it reduces air bubbles and it helps me shape it up. And then Claire uses little retractors just to pull the lip forward like that. And then I can then get to the mouth. So let's have a look at Mary from the front here. I do want to say, cause I've had a number of questions about these, these little retractors here that go in there. Now, what we've done is we've, I've just took these through into the lab, into the dental lab. Um, they, they were actually originally photographic retractors and I've just taken a tungsten carbide and cut them right down so the two little hooks and then they can just go on the lip and just draw it forward. They are just brilliant and I recommend you using those as soon as you go back to work. So secondly, what I'm going to do is now I'm going to inject the material in the neocolloid underneath the tongue all the way around on that lingual area first, up and over and then onto the buccal sulcus. So I inject it first using that. And then I then, secondly, I place the impression material down and then rotate it in, get the patient to close and massage the cheek. I'll just show you that in a video and I'll talk you through it. So here we go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna inject into the retromylohyoid area all the way around lingually, up and over the retromolar pad, and then into the buccal labial sulcus, all the way around. So that's that done. I then pick up my tray here, the frame cutback tray. It's got a lot of material in it. I rotate it in gently, sit it over the lower ridge. Claire takes the retractors out. And I get the patient to stick their tongue forward and I then count them. I say, relax your tongue. One, two, three, four, five. And then push it down at the back. Get the patient to close up onto the, it's got a lovely platform for them to close up there on the lips. 
and then I massage the cheeks thoroughly. Massaging the cheeks helps me to see where the edge of the mandible is. Brilliant. And it's really predictable. I just very rarely have to do this again. But if you look at this here closely, we've got some great detail. We've got the retromolar pad is beautifully shown on the impression. All of the lingual sulcus all the way around and also the labial sulcus all the way around. Plus, if you look closely, that there is the edge of the mandible. So, and now it's time to draw and design a special tray. So Rowan makes a big rapport, a massive model, a huge. It's got these retromolar pads on there, and we make a special tray, close fitting tray, to fit onto that. And I'm gonna take you step by step through that. This is, out of everything I'm talking tonight, this is the most important part of the webinar. It's, it's really good. So what I do is I draw round where the retromolar pad is, here like this, there, and then where on that little arrow just there shows this is a semea sinew. This is a piece of, of of sinew that actually comes across. It's the buccinator. It's a little bit of tendon, and it attaches itself into the base of the retromolar pad. And it's something that Japanese anatomists have discovered, and we never knew about this at all. I was not taught this at dental school, but it's an important structure because watch this when we pull it here, and when the patient moves, that moves too. So I want to avoid the denture or the special tray from going across this movable bit. So we sweep it in and under around the retromolar pad and then back out again, just like this. So we draw underneath that semea sinew and then this line here is two millimeters short of the edge of the mandible. We avoid freeing them around the front. And then when we get to the front here, the anterior portion, we want it to be two millimeters short of the depth of the sulcus anteriorly here. Really, really, really important. And then when we come to the inside, this is very important. So what I do now is I draw a line vertically from the middle of the retromolar pad down to the edge, the mylohyoid line here. And I stop, I finish it, I terminate it at the three position. Now this first line enables a second line to be drawn here. And this is, this is drawn two millimeters behind that first line. We draw it down and this drops into the mylohyoid space. And then we then make it converge in the three region just here. So that's a really important part of the special tray design there. And then we then finish this by just bringing it from that convergence point there just on the edge of the mandible. So this is just the, the border of the mandible. This is soft tissue, we don't go there. Just on the edge of the mandible, avoid this lingual frenum as well. So we've got space. And then, so quite simply, we just do it on the other side. Now, you, I bet you're thinking, well, how do I do this practically at the moment if I work in practice and then the, the impression goes to the technician. Well, what I advise is at first is get the impression back like that. Sorry, get the model back, the cast, and then draw on it exactly where you want to go. And do that a few times with your technician. And I reckon within four goes, uh, the, your technician will understand exactly where to draw the extensions to. So what Rowan does now is he then makes a special tray which fits to the outside of the line. So it's, it goes to the full extension of that line all the way around. This is a close fitting tray, so it fits directly onto the model. And we're gonna use zinc oxide eugenol for that impression, or Imprigum if the patient's got an allergy. 
So, and it's got three handles and it means I can manipulate it really easily here. So now all of this information is on my website and you can download that this picture comes from a denture construction manual that Rowan and I have written. And it, it shows step by step all of those six design sequences for producing this special tray. So just doing that alone will make, I, I reckon you'll see a massive improvement in the stability of your dentures just by doing that. So go to my speaking page to do that. So you go to the website and you'll be able to find the uh, document there. So go to speaking at finleysutton.co.uk, scroll down and you'll find some really great resources for you. So there's the construction manual. It's got everything we're talking about in tonight in written format. That's like your handout for this evening's lecture. And also all the materials and equipment that we use. And also very clear photographs like we've got tonight's presentation is in that seven pillars section. So just go straight in there and download it. So now what I want to do now is to move to visit two. We have two week intervals between our visits. So if we fast forward, so this is for the lower impression now. I just want to keep with the lower because um, it sort of makes sense to do this in, in one together whilst you're just learning. So I'm going to add green stick to the tray. Now, when I add green stick to it, I don't put anything on the fitting surface. I put it on the outside of the tray. And I'm just going to show you how, where I put it for the buckle shelves to start off with. That's where I put it on first. And the way I use it is this. So now we've got hot water coming out the tap here into this kidney dish here. In that kidney dish, I've got green stick compound softening. So the water's quite hot. It's around about 60 degrees C. So it softens that green stick really nicely. I've got Vaseline on my gloved fingers. I've got the tray in my hand. And then I've got a Bunsen here, which is going. So what I do is I get a piece of green stick that's about the size, thickness of an earthworm, a thick earthworm, just to go from the just the seven to the three region i'll show you and i stick it on but this is the key to it sticking onto the tray i heat up the border of the tray so it's hot and then the green stick loves it it sticks to it really well and the vaseline on my gloves stops it from um sticking to my gloves and so I've put it on from the seven to the three. I then heat up the other border in the uh, Bunsen, warming it right up, stick it on the buckle shelf. It's not on the fitting surface. And it just, when it's warm like this and soft, it just molds beautifully in the mouth and really beautifully at the border molding. So, I'm going to take this to the mouth now. You can actually see those are nice and soft there. I take that to the mouth and I get the patient to go e ooh with me holding that tray in and they mold the borders. And then secondly, I put green stick on the lingual. And this is a rather than a thick earthworm, this is a thin earthworm placed on the outside of the tray not on the retromolar pads at all but this bit's going to be border molded by the patient so i pop that in hold it down get them to hold open wide and then close lick their lip push against the lower strut with the tongue and then have a powerful swallow and so that's they're the movements that we do and then I dry off that totally, add zinc oxide and not too much, just a thin layer, or it could be Imprigum if we're needing to use Imprigum. And then we take it to the mouth and then we 
put all of those movements together, those six movements. These are very important movements that Dr. Abe has developed for suction. So here we go. Let's take this to the mouth. Claire's got our lovely retractors in. I rotate that in place. Works beautifully. Sit it down onto the ridge firmly. So I'm really wiggling it. Get the patient to close up and then go e, ooh, and then open wide and then close and then lick the lip really go for it licking the lip push your tip of your tongue against the strut firm squirt some water in this is what claire does and then has a good powerful swallow so these movements they're all accommodating this special tray to all these potential movements the patient's going to assume during their everyday life periphery superb so look at that, all these polished surfaces are all beautifully done. You can see how these stub handles keep out of the way of the lips and the cheek and the tongue. And then what we need to do is, Rowan really skillfully replicates that in the final denture. So this is poured carefully. So the models that we have are really, we, we look after them and Rowan, preserves this is a real important technical detail any technicians watching this keep that land area all the way round because this enables rowan to wax the denture up properly on those polished surfaces and so we basically we have a replica in the final denture of the impression and it is it's so rare that i actually have to touch the periphery of the denture once we finished it. I don't have to do any adjustments, it's really good. So what I want to do now is talk about the upper. So I've got, so I want to have really great suction on the upper denture like this for John. So you now I want to be able to pull on the denture and I don't want to throw them out. And I want this here, 100% of my upper denture cases, not eight, not twenty percent like the lower, hundred percent. And this technique is all down to phrase and accord. It's fantastic. So you know, this is me back. This is what Fraser said to me twenty years ago about the quality of my <laughs> prosthodontic work. Um, and it was true. I just knew nothing, and it was basically it was like thin. You need to learn about this. You need to get your head in the books, learn it. So, and so I've used this technique ever since and it's wonderful. So here we go. So for the primary impression, what I do is I want to capture um, the whole of the upper ridge to produce a really good special tray. So, and it's just the same technique. So we've got the syringe and I have a stock tray here. This is a, Pegasus transform stock tray. They're superb, nicely designed. Uh, so I inject into the sulcus using the neo colloid all the way round. I'm thinking in my mind about getting behind that tuberosity. It's really good. And then secondly, I've got my tray loaded with alginate here and I've rehearsed it with the patient so that they know what's coming. And I then talk to them hypnotically about what we're doing in a really calm voice. So I just rotate it in, sit it up at the back of the mouth, and then gently push up and over. Claire gently removes those retractors. And I then just feed it into the sulcus all the way around the edge. And I'm wanting, I'm picturing in my mind, get just capturing the whole of that around the tuberosities. I want to go beyond, way beyond where my post dam is going to be, because I want to make a special tray on a cast produced from this impression, like this. So, so we get a 
we get this, the uh, primary cast there. And this is much, it's so simple. Two millimeters short of the depth of sulcus all the way round. That's what we want the special tray to be. Two millimeters short of that depth of the sulcus. And also we want the extension posteriorly beyond the fovea palatini. Quite simple. And the tray is lovely. This is a spaced tray. So it's not close fitting like the lower. It's spaced with one layer of wax. One layer of wax goes on here and then Rowan makes that. And it's got one handle on it. And it's just dead easy to manipulate and do the impression. So now because the tray is made with a, a wax spacer, on the uh, plaster, I recreate that in green stick in the mouth. I, I've tried to have uh, Rowan make it on here before we actually, um, beforehand, you know, so we get stops on the tray. I don't find it works as well for me. I prefer to do it myself like this. So I find that the tray stops hurt the patient. So what I do is I put green stick on the fitting surface. So right on the back of the tray. This is not on the edge. This is on the fitting surface. So this is our posterior palatal seal area. And then two bits on the canines. If the canine points nice and solid. And this recreates our space. So that's soft. We take this to the mouth. So I try it in. And if the edge here, so this is looking up at maybe the four or five region, if that border of the tray is pushing up into the reflection of the sulcus with my green stick stops on, it's too long. So I draw a line on it and then take it to the lab, trim it back with a tungsten carbide, take it back to the mouth, and then just make sure I've got this lovely space here. Look at that. That space is now ready to be molded by the green stick and then by the alginate. It's superb. So I'll show you what we do then. So the second bit of green stick I add from the canine back behind the tuberosity, both sides here. And I flare out that so green stick, I pucker it out. So, and then I then take this to the mouth, push it up, mold the cheek, mold the cheek, waggle a jaw, because I'm thinking about all my anatomy, you know, here. So this coronoid process is gonna come across when they go from side to side there. I want all of that molded and it comes out looking like this, narrow but it's been molded by the patient. There, look at how narrow that is, it's lovely. So I also want to make sure I've got some suction on it too at this point. That's why I don't have it perforated. So next what I do, I'm ready now to do my wash impression in alginate. So I put alginate adhesive all over the tray and onto the buccal surfaces. And then I fill this with and I use dense ply blueprint it's lovely material I mix it runny and then I glaze it with my uh, water on my finger and so this uh, reduces the air bubbles it's lovely and I don't overfill the tray it's really important so here we've got the patient got Julie in the chair uh, retractors in we've rehearsed this I rotate it into the mouth sit it up at the back first to stop it flowing down the throat and then push it up like that and it flows up into the sulcus all the way round it's just lovely so and then claire just gently takes these out let's turn round we've got ellen here with it in place so i'm going to push it firmly up onto the ridge firmly keeping my finger on the tray and pulling the cheek trimming and border molding pulling downwards in a circular motion pulling it down narrow underneath the base of the nose 
coronoid process, waggling. And then finally, a really good one, suck my finger firmly. Look at the modiolus contracting. So, and that actually does help with getting a great suction on an upper denture, it's brilliant. But let's have a look at it inside here. It's just so good because we've got the tray and then the alginate has done all that work. It's fantastic. And it's border molded beautifully by the patient. So it's all accommodating all these different movements the patient is going to make. So what I want to see um, and the sign of a good impression is I've pushed it down fully onto my green stick stops all the way around. And then we've got this beautiful roll, peripheral roll of impression material, which is going to enable our, you know, suction on the denture, good retention. And then Rowan looks after the plaster really carefully and make sure that we have this land area. You can see the detail here. This is where the coronoid has narrowed the area. And then, so all of this is helping us to develop the polished surface of the final denture precisely. And it means that I don't need to adjust it very much at all. So, so that, in a nutshell, is our impressions uh, done. So now I want to now move forward to visit uh, three, which is prescribing the tooth positions. And this is a, a really nice artistic part of the whole process. I love this. And what I'm trying to do with the tooth positions is really, I want to put the natural teeth back. I want to put the denture teeth in the same place as the natural teeth. And if we can do that, the dentures not only look great, they function beautifully as well because the teeth are in the zone of minimal conflict, the neutral zone. So if the patient's class one, that's where we put the teeth. If they're class two, division one with a big overjet, that's what we do. If they're class two, division two with a deep overbite, that's what we do. And if they're class three, that's what we give them. So that's how we work it. Very much with them being part of the whole process though. Doing what the patient wants is really, really important. So, so let's move to visit three now. So here we go. So these are, this is what I would recommend as you go to jaw registration stage. So these are called Manchester rims. Fraser McCord developed them when he was in Manchester. So the lower, this is the Manchester rim at the bottom here, it's pivots there. So it's, it's almost like a full wax block, but with a center bit cut out. And then the upper wax block is like this with a shellac base, big. It's overbuilt here. This is really important. Rowan overbuilds this so I can carve it back in set stages. And then the lower pivot enables a very easy trimming to get the correct OVD and also helps us to get RCP as well with the patient. So let's, let's go through this. Now what I really need to have and I really want the patient to bring in and find, like Henry has here, Henry's brought, brought in, Henry's in his 90s there, he's got his wax rim in place. Um, I actually cut a post dam at this visit to make the this actually stay in better. So I cut a post dam right across the fovea palatini have a look in the denture textbook in the construction manual. It shows exactly how I do that. But that's important for it to stay in place. I've got Henry there with this wax rim in and I carve it and I look at his, look at that lovely wedding picture here. It gives us loads of detail. Look at this. It gives us good information about tooth positions, buccal corridors, etc. Really important, so just like this. And you can see, this is Julie here. Me and Claire are looking at Julie. She's dentate picture here at the age of 12, which is helping us. And she's got a wax rim in, both of us looking at the patient. And we, what I want to do, and what Claire does as well is, because Claire's worked with me for 13 years, she's got a great 
eye for knowing when we've carved the rim co correctly, where we're up to. So Claire and I have a constant dialogue during this visit. It's really, it's, it's a lovely, relaxing visit and it's really nice. And we have the patient sitting upright in the chair like this, because I want to see the patient in that social setting. And Claire comes round and has a good look at the patient here. And it's great. So now it's a recipe, this simple recipe. Number one, I carve the lip support first. Get that right. Number two, I carve the incisal plane and I use a fox's bite plane to help me with this and Claire helps me with this so I hold the fox's bite plane on and the patient looks at Claire I want to get it parallel with the interpupillary lines if that's what we're wanting to do if we want if the patient has a, a cant on the photograph on their smile and they want to replicate that we replicate the cant thirdly is the we get the occlusal plane parallel to the ala tragus this is crucial and what i use it here to do this is we use the fox's bite plane in the mouth to check and then to trim it i have a wallpaper scraper which i heat up in the bunsen burner apply it to the wax rim and then trim that this is absolutely critical for the aesthetics is this carving that parallel to the ala tragus gives us a great looking denture and then number four i look at the buccal corridors of what we're trying to reproduce on the photo if the patient wants it if the patient wants a wall-to-wall -wall smile that's what we give them so it's very much a dialogue with the patient and then number five center line so I carved that on the rim like this. So, so that's the upper rim sorted, done. That's five steps. The lower now is the pivot. This goes in and I want to trim this, first of all, to the right occlusal vertical dimension, just like we've got Anne here with the, uh, the right OVD. And what we do is, Claire and I, we use the John Coyce system of getting the right vertical, which is, if the patient looks right, they are right. So, and so it's really just a dialogue. And we'll look at the patient, I'll look at Claire. Claire will say, a bit too open. She'll just do a, my, a memo. And I know that I've just got to close them down a touch. And once we've got them looking right, that's where we're at. And then the other thing is that after that, what I want to do is verify I've got them into centric relation or retruded contact position, as we call it in Britain, and I want to verify that. So get the patient to open, curl their tongue back, close together, and I want to see both of them meeting simultaneously and evenly. And then I fix them together. So we cut in a groove on the upper, both sides. And then with Claire holding retractors like that, with them in a static position, I inject FUTAR D by registration material in. So it's really simple. Wait for that to set and then I can take it out. And then what I do is I just separate them like that. And then a quick, literally a five minute job, I do a face bow transfer on that. So I squirt some FUTAR on and then fit the um, upper rim onto that there let it set take it to the mouth we get we've got so the patient holds it in place and i do the face bow i use a danar system um, we happen to have the danar articulator system at the practice any good quality face bow and articulator system will work lovely for this so this is what goes back to Rowan. So we've got basically our jaw reg here with the pivot there, and we've got the upper, um, 
we've got the face bow. And then this just gets mounted like that. So the upper cast definitive model gets attached to the articulator like that. The face bow is taken off. The pivots are fitted. And then the whole thing is fitted together like that. And that's it. And then it's ready for the try-in like this. So, but I just want to show you just before we move on now, this, this is, um, um, and I'm just so proud. I think this is Roman's finest work that he's ever done. It's just the most beautiful upper denture you could imagine with extended teeth. We've got black triangles. We've got lovely thin ginger V. We've got buckle corridors. What we want to do is we want, just want the patient to look like they've got natural teeth. So I don't want the dentures looking like dentures. It's lovely. So now at visit three also, this is very, very important. I select the teeth. And what I want to do is to have, if I've got the patient here, so if you imagine Jen is sitting in the chair, she's having the, the these are existing dentures which we're going to replace. This is a lovely wedding picture of her smile. Look at that arrangement, it's beautiful. Um, we can use this to select the right size of teeth with this formula here. Now, it's not complicated at all. It's dead easy to use. Just download this from the construction manual and you can start using it. It's a method that Dr. John Besford developed years ago and it's a ratio. And what we do is we measure the patient's pupillary distance in the chair here. We measure an enlarged photograph of their pupillary distance from their dentate picture and we measure the upper central incisors here, the two there, and that gives us a, a, a measurement. So this measurement here is that that's the measurement of the, the width of the two upper central incisors. And from that, we can then find out what size the teeth are. And then just using our, we can actually either have some denture teeth themselves, like this, so we've got 8.4 millimeter. We can actually look on a mold chart, find the teeth of corresponding size, and then we can select the different shapes that's gonna be right for the patient. So now I don't, but at this point, I don't get the patient to participate. It's just me and Rowan choose this because looking at cards like that of teeth, it's very difficult for a patient to know what shape they are going to have but so for instance with with jen here we felt these triangular enigma life teeth just suited and looked just like her natural teeth there so and look at how, the difference we've got here for jen so and this is you know we've got lovely beautiful buckle corridors here and because we've carved the occlusal plane parallel to the elytragus we get this beautiful curve of the upper incisors being parallel to the lower lip. And also, Rowan puts in movement with them. We've been brave with these tooth positions, you know, kicking out that central a little bit and the lateral and taking the upper left central back a bit. It's lovely. And the other thing is, looking at lowers like Bert's here, Look at Bert's lower incisors there when he's talking. They, I like making them wonky because it makes them look like natural teeth. We don't have to do it as extreme as that. We can make it a little bit more subtle, but it's just so it's so it's so much fun putting yeah um, wearing and just really making them look real. Because when we're chatting with him, I just don't want them to look straight. Now, patient acceptance is really important. So when we have a wax try-in, you know, all of the teeth are arranged into wax here. I want to, the patient to have a good look at them. So I want to share with you Diane now. So this is how Diane presented to me. Um, this photograph here is when she had on the left is when she had a immediate denture. And then she was wearing, this was the, 
the denture that she was wearing when she came to see me, which was functioning reasonably well. She wasn't totally happy with the aesthetic. She was very, she wanted a specific aesthetic look and she wanted a natural teeth back. That's what she wanted in terms of the look. And she had quite a big overjet and, and almost looking at that incompetent lips. So this was us at trying one here. So now when we get a wax trying, Claire takes a video of the patient just like this. So, and then starts to engage with the patient. So this is Claire just chatting away with the patient, asking her, um, you know, what she's been doing, where she, what's, how's work going? Um, if, where have you been on holiday? What books have you been reading? Um, what are you watching on telly at the moment? So, and do you know what? Diane, when Diane looked at this, and this is what we do, we just sit them down with Claire. She looked at it and she hated it. She said, I look dead with this in. And because she said to me, when I walk down the high street in Garstang, and I've just got my face at rest when I had my normal teeth, my natural teeth. Um, people thought that I was smiling. So her resting face, because she had incompetent lips, it looked like she was smiling and she wanted that back. So let's have a look at, this is visit four, visit five actually. We did another try-in, total reset. So, and can you see, look at this, we brought them further forward and up, almost a little bit, almost V-shaped, you know, with this AOB here. And she sat and looked at these and, and I, you know, when I put these in, I tried them in originally, you know, when I just put them in, I was like, oh, a bit horrified, really. Um, but we just sat her down and, and she went and she loved it. And she brought her husband in here, Peter, who helped to us to look at both the pictures and he had a great eye for detail as well and he could remember Diane's teeth how they used to look and so they sat together and having a supportive partner like this in this whole process just makes life so much easier it's wonderful and she loved it so here we've got on the left that was the dead teeth the dead look and then this is on the right hand side uh, with this AOB and mu mimicking more so her natural teeth, like with some improvements in terms of aesthetics. Look at her arch form here. Look how V-shaped that is. And this is really important. I, this is what we always talk about, Rowan and I. We just want technicians to be brave. Throw the rule book out for, you, um, for the upper anterior teeth. Throw it out. Just give them natural teeth and it looks so much better. Um, and this is her with a big AOB. You can see here, it's occluding on these posterior teeth there. And then further forward, it's open. But this is probably like, very much like a natural teeth used to be. You know, if we had a look, she probably had an AOB like that. So in terms of it eating and chewing, it, was, it has not been a problem at all for her so we're nearly at the end of this now and i just want to bring everything together just by showing you Anne from start to finish so and Anne, believe me Anne set out i thought this was going to be the hardest denture that i've ever made and i'm not joking so she had this to start off with so you can see the old denture in place it's too far down and the teeth are too far back it's, it's traditional bad denture british standard denture on the ridge let's have a look in the mouth though now her history was that she'd had four dental implants done in the past and i get referred a lot of patients who've had implants that have failed and they don't want to have any more implants done. But look here, we've got no sulcus here at all. So, and in terms of making a denture for this patient, it's just the same steps, but I'm not gonna jump ahead. I just wanna show you what it was like at the consultation. So this is her at consultation. I was so shocked by this that I videoed it. 
this is me with my finger and I'm running it along the um, the crest of the mandible. And can you see her jumping? She's flinching with pain and it's just, and I'm not pressing hard at all. I'm just literally just resting my finger, gloved finger on the, there. So I was like, how on earth am I going to make a denture on this? So I got Rowan to come through and Rowan did some coloring whilst I was palpating. And just on this diagram here, this represents where I could place proper pressure, you know, firm pressure, these green bits, but everywhere else where the teeth are and the pink flange area there, it was sore and it was really tender. So this was me at the consultation and I was, I was like really worried about this. So I chatted with, with Anne and her husband together and they were just lovely people um, and really understood the problem. And so I said to her that, and I just felt immediately it's going to have to be more implants. Anne, um, even though the others have failed, I think a fixed lower bridge hybrid is just the only way to go. Anyway, and I said to her, look, uh, if I made you a full lower denture, I'm only 30% sure that this is going to be successful for you. And I reckon that you always, even if it was successful, you're always going to have some discomfort. So, um, so she considered this and she said, Finn, I want you to go ahead and I want you to make this denture. Um, and I actually decided to make her a, it's moloplast B soft lining. So it's a soft lining, normal shape to the denture, but it's soft lining on the fitting surface of this denture. And now I just want to share with you, this is very, very important, this, the steps. I've shown you tonight using pivots for, for re registering centric relation. Now, I don't use these. I've shown you this tonight because it's a really good way, particularly if you are in, working in the national health or in a state funded where funding is really limited way of getting the occlusion accurately. But because I work in specialist practice and I just want the bite to be perfect and often these patients have got really flat ridges, I want to use a gothic arch system for registering the bite and i'll show you about that just in a minute but so in order to do this i still require five visits it's no different but at my definitive impression stage i do a primary jaw reg with the specific purpose of getting the central bearing apparatus to work properly in the mouth it, the primary reg is nothing to do with prescribing the tooth positions. And then I do a registration process at number three. So this is what I did for Anne. So Anne, visit one, primary impressions, just like I've shown you tonight. Visit two, definitive impressions, just like I've shown you tonight, border molded beautifully. I changed the lower impression material to a softer material, which is uh, alginate, just purely because that was so tender. And also, and because I'm wanting to use a gothic arch, I'm using a, uh, this is a primary jaw reg procedure. And this is just a rough pivot that is made on the primary cast there. So that's made on the primary cast and an upper rim. And this is just done very quickly to get the patient at the correct vertical dimension or close to the correct vertical dimension. So it doesn't take me long. I just trim that. We both look at the patient to see if they look right. The John Coyce method, if they look right there. And then this enables me and or Rowan to set up the central bearing apparatus properly. So, so what we do is I fix that together, the two the pivots there, and this then gets mounted onto the articulator, and then 
So that enables us to mount both the upper and lower definitive models because they're trimmed. And then the Gothic arch system is made to fit our definitive cast here, just like that. So, and this is it here. And these are brilliant for recording center relation. Absolutely class. So if we now move to visit three, I use these rims first. These are totally new. These are made on our definitive cast and I carve it in just the same way as I've just been through those, those five steps for the upper and then get the OVD correct with the lower first. And then I move on to the Gothic arch tracing second. But so this is my wax rim first in place, carved just the same at the right vertical. That photograph is done for Rowan to set the teeth up. And then the second part of the visit is to do the Gothic arch tracing. So we've got these plates. So the upper is a plate here. This is a Swiss system. It's, it's the Gerber condylator system, upper and lower here like that. So what I do is I put China graph on this upper like this, take this to the mouth there, and, and then I get the patient to move forwards and backwards, just like this. It's fantastic. Forwards and back, forwards and back, forwards and back, side to side. And they get, get Nancy to move all over and she's drawing an arrow, a triangle on this. I love it. It's just so good, this. It's so accurate. Um, look here, so we've got that. That is our central relation contact position there. That is CR. And what we do, we put a plastic disc over that there. And then I take this back to the mouth and then inject futar between them. So we take that back to the mouth, fit it together and squirt that right in. So it's locked in beautifully. So that is our bite registration in CR. And then, so if we look at, uh, we've got Anne now, we're gonna take her back through the stages. So the upper rim is mounted using our face bar transfer. So the upper model's mounted using that, that's taken away. This is the Gothic arch system that's fitted and that relates the lower to the upper precisely in central relation. And I just don't, seriously, with using this system, I have very, very few occlusal problems at all. So Rowan set the teeth up. This is like the classic two, uh, class two, division two with butterfly laterals. If we look really closely here, we've got, it's just round, we've got this lovely moloplast soft lining there on it. This, I say to the patient, this moloplast is going to last between 18 months and 24 months, and then we'll need to do a reline um, and replace it. But I do find it lasts a bit longer than that, particularly if patients are careful with it and clean it. Um, without using toothpaste or denture cream, as long as they use just liquid soap and brush it uh, gently, then it's, it's fine, it's good. So I want to just show you the difference between the old denture and new here. This is the old denture, and look at this. I'll superimpose the new one. This is like the snowshoe principle spreading the denture, maximizing that denture bearing area to distribute the loads and making sure the peripheries are in that functional width of the sulcus so it's not going to be interfered with by the soft tissues. And then if we flip it over, that's the fitting surface. So this is the Moloplast B soft lining material. Now, now in order to get, if we just remember, um, and how her lower ridge was so sore when, um, uh, when I palpated it. So if you imagine this is the new denture there, I'll take that to the mouth, press that down, 
and then I ask her, this is the fit visit, so this is visit five, press it down, and then she'll point to, I'll say, can you point to where it's sore? Just tell me. So she'll point to it, and it was at the front, around the front area. So what I do is take the denture out, put silicone, a lot. I put, first of all, because this is first, because that silicone there, is that's a soft lining which is made of silicone, Moloplast B, I put Vaseline on, and then I squirt in on here a light bodied impression material, pop it over the ridge and press it down firmly and let it set. I take it out and then disinfect it, and then using a Sharpie pen, I draw on these areas that have pushed through where she's indicating it's sore like that there and then I peel that off and then this is like painting by numbers I just grind off these areas here that have that I've got the marking on from the sharpie I use this a moloplast trimming burr that's very important we use the right burr for this material because a tungsten carbide doesn't cut it and then I do it again and I do it over and over again at the fit appointment until it's comfortable until she can walk out of the surgery and um, it not be sore so let's and it worked really well so here she is at the beginning now look at those teeth there the British standard denture too far down and too far back it's horrible so let's put the teeth back where they should be there so we've, we've just lifted them up we've brought them out a little bit but lifted them up and these nice little uh, flying laterals for her and we had six reviews for her to make them comfortable and this is the overall um, amount of clinical time that it took me so 13 and a half hours clinical time rowan in terms of the fabricating of them 15 hours and uh, that was the total fee there that she paid. So, and I see very small numbers of patients. It's a really, you know, I, I treat them. Um, it, we take a long time over them and we do it to the best possible standard. So in the past 13 years, I've seen 342 complete denture patients. And interestingly, none of them that I've done conventional dentures for so far have requested implants yet and i'm sure they will do um in the future but it's quite interesting so using all these very careful steps then it's great so thank you very very much for listening tonight it's been brilliant um chatting with you um and i'm now going to um i will take questions uh, so i'm going to have a good look through the chat and i'll go to the beginning and start all the way through Next week on Tuesday, I'm doing it on immediate dentures, doing two during the day then. And then that's the for the handout. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop the slide share. And I'm going to just select speaker view. That's great there. So and I'm going to have a good look at your chat to see what you've been putting down here so that's terrific so let's go have a look at the right at the top there so that's great you're from all over the world it's just amazing thank you fantastic um, usa everywhere australia saudi arabia serbia wales mexico right let's have a look so is it possible to watch your previous webinars yep youtube and facebook just type the name in you'll be able to find them um, that's fine to do So that's good. Julie Bell talks about if people are interested in mindfulness, then 
dental update to doing a webinar with Ruby Wax. Absolutely. So Ruby Wax has been part of that book that I recommended at the beginning, um, which is terrific. Uh, let's have a look. So BPS dentures, Mark Truman, BPS dentures. What is the system called? No, it isn't BPS dentures. Um, BPS is a very good system, um, and this is advocated by um, uh, by uh, Dr. Abe. But I don't like it fully because I don't get the best aesthetics with it. The BPS system is a little bit standardised for setting up the anterior teeth. There's no wax rim part, and so it's seven point eight millimeters from the center of the incisal papilla to the labial aspect of the front teeth. That's the standard that the BPS recommends. So, and I, we know that the, from the center of the incisal papilla to the outside labial surface of the teeth, anatomically, if we looked at all of us now who are watching tonight, if we measured it, it would be between 5.5 and 12 millimeters. So there's quite a bit of leeway. It's not 7.5. That's why I don't like the BBS system. But it is, it's, if you want to up your game with dentures, it's worth looking at. But it, my system here that I've talked about tonight is like an amalgamation of a little bit of BPS, a bit of phrasing the chord, some, um, all sorts of people that have been mentors in my life. John Bessford. Do, do. So it says here, someone's asking you about Marjola Davini. How do you improve the, tri the tray for making impression for extensive total dentures on a lower arch, which is extremely atrophied? So it's a good question. I've covered it tonight. It's exactly what I'm talking about. So you can have a massive ridge or a flat ridge or a concave ridge, just those steps are really important and it's just the type of patients i see you just got nothing that's that and so we just have to design the tray according to the those steps in that construction manual and it will it really will help Peter Ward, yeah, the Alma syringe works well. Yeah, so it's a good syringe that's really important for the uh, primary impression. So everything, Julie Bell said, please, Finley, could you repeat the process briefly? So uh, it's, I've, it's all on YouTube. I've got all of these impression techniques. If you just look up Finley Sutton, YouTube channel there's lots of ways of showing you and it can talk you through it and I'll be putting this in this up on Facebook too and uh, and also the um, on YouTube this particular presentation Vishal Patel it, what is the importance of special trays? Is there absolutely any way of taking a perfect impression first time without having to get special trays? I know the answer is no, but what's your opinion on developing techniques to achieve this? E.g. potentially taking heavy bodied putty in with too many. Look, no, there isn't, Vishal. You're absolutely, you've answered your own question. Um, you can. You could make a denture on the primary cast, yes, but it's going to rub. It's going to be overextended or it's going to be underextended. So why not just take it to another level? We don't have a magic wand, unfortunately, for this sort of thing. I'm sorry. Um, do, do, Martin James, hi. What makes ZOE your preference for the lower impression? Um, McCord's randomized controlled trial showed it's less preferable to patients compared with silicone admix. I think it's a good question that. My, I look, the impression materials I use work really nicely in my hands. And I think it's really important to 
the border moldings the most important bit of the whole lot you know the special tray design then the border molding and what is actually put into it afterwards is uh, not Im as important so you know if you like using light bodied silicone use a light bodied silicone if you like using alginate use alginate i love zinc oxide for a lower it just flows beautifully it's got a lovely setting time and it doesn't take too long to set either it's like four minutes from point of mixing i think or five minutes so that's good chris tavere hi finley if the green stick overlaps onto the fitting surface of the lower do you use a scalpel blade to scrape it off on here um yes i do i i actually just do it with a wax knife i just warm up the wax knife and just scrape it back off but i don't get too obsessed about it it's not too much of a problem particularly when i'm using zinc oxide Do do. That's good. Nizreen Ahmed is asking a really good question about why do I not put green stick on the labial flange here? This is because I don't put it on the labial flange because if I put it there, it bulks it just underneath the base of the nose here too much. So the denture can look puffy like that. If we look at resorption patterns here where teeth have been extracted, it is very, very, it needs to be really, really thin under the base of the nose because the, this is nasal bone at the top there and that doesn't resorb back. So the lip support is created by the teeth themselves, not by this thickness up here. And this is really, really important from an aesthetic perspective. And this is where the old textbooks have it totally wrong it, and they say border mold at the top here and it gives us that puffy lip look so it must be really thin and that's why i want it lovely and thin under the base of the nose there this is something john bestford talked to me about to in the year 2000 and i've been doing it ever since and the aesthetics improved massively it's really really important Do, do. Hi Finley. So um, I can't pronounce your surname, Col Coleman. It's an Irish first name. I'm sorry. Um, hi Finley. Is there a, any real difference between green stick and pink stick to mould? We were told in uni there's less chance of burning a patient with pink stick. Any truth to that? Um, maybe. The, actually, pink stick does work quite nicely as well. Um, and it just melts at a lower temperature. So, but I think it's just about with the green stick, I don't burn the patient because what I do is I put it in the Bunsen and then back into the warm water. So I temper it and then take it to the mouth. So I never burn the patient with it. But pink works nicely. Pink's better than silicones, I think. Heavy body silicones. And that's Anish Bali has asked me, hi Finley, why don't you use light and heavy body silicones? Because I find that I overextend the impression with them. I've tried to do it. I went to Japan, learned it from Dr. Abe, came back, we had a go. And me and Rowan, we just said, I'm not doing it. We'll copy the tray design and the basic principles, but we'll do it in green stick and ZOE like we like. So, do do. So, Sne Punjabi says, Do we get land area um, due to beading and boxing technique? So, actually, Rowan isn't here to talk about this, but he basically, when he's pouring the model, he builds it really big and, and high and takes it right the way round and then carefully just takes this, the impression tray off, he heats it up. So the, he warms it up in warm water, takes it off, peels it off beautifully, and then just carefully just trims around the edge there with a, a blade so it's nice and flat. 
So it, there's no boxing beading. It's just preserving that peripheral roll as best you can. So yeah, someone's asked me, why do I like the upper impression better with alginate it's, than zinc oxide? I like alginate in the upper because um, it flows beautifully. Now, it, I've tried using zinc oxide in the past, and because it's such a large surface area, when I use zinc oxide, press it up, and it just takes, sometimes I get missing bits on the edges at the back here, and even though I've, I'm applying a lot of pressure, so it's been just because it's a larger surface area, I have a runnier material, which is that runny alginate, pop it in, and it, it flows beautifully. The only time I use it in the upper is if I've got a window on it, you know, here for that flabby ridge. If you look at webinar one, it talks about flabby ridges on that one. Isabel Fraser, um, good question. If your lab's not next door, are you concerned about dimensional stability of alginate um, between impression and port? Not at all. New modern alginates, if they're packaged nicely, placed in with a gauze, sealed bag, moist, protected, they last for um, five days perfectly. And there's good research to show that. There's quite a lot of papers on that, so it's not an issue. Um, do, do, someone's asking... Um, do you do you have lots a lot of patients who want to try the natural smile and go back to a more Hollywood smile? Do you factor that in the time and cost if they're not sure? No, I don't actually. Um, I don't factor any. I just give them a quote at the beginning, um, and then if we need to do a retry, I, what I'll do is I'll assess the patient, and if I think they're going to be maybe a little bit picky about the aesthetics, I will build in two try-ins as standard to their, and if they don't need it, then that's great. And then if they do, then that's fine. But some, so, um, and it's very much patient preference, but I use a lot of um, photographs of patients I've previously treated and try and, and I'll show the patient, the new patient, previous patients that I've treated that maybe look a bit similar and then show them how much better natural looking aesthetics will be for them. I don't do any pressure, high pressure though, it's very much what they want. And as a rule, patients, my patients like to have them too light, but a little bit wonky, more like their natural arrangement, but really clean and white looking. Um, I love it when they want to go f whole hog, you know, which is just edge appropriate, natural looking. I love that. That's like when me and Rowan get dead excited. It's good. Um, so, and then there's another question here. How does Rowan select the teeth? Are they all from the same set? if characterizing pretty much it's a good question so we do tend to go for you know one set so whatever the mold will be we'll pick that that is a general so that's 90 percent of the time that's what we'll be doing but sometimes from the de from the photo of the patient that we have they've got really quite unique sizes of teeth so that's when we may have to pick different molds um, to within that arrangement um, so it's good. So where can you see your videos on Finley Sutton YouTube? So Alan Bergen, hi Alan. Uh, adjusting the incisal length after the lip support. Um, do you ever find you've over reduced lip support because the increased length of the rim holds the lip out? So 
Alan, that's a good question. So, you know, my recipes for, which is, it's a really important order, lip support first, incisal plane. I do the lip support first and I'll do the incisal plane and I might go back to the um, lip support second as well. So just do those two things first, lip support, incisal plane. They, they're almost amalgamated together in one and two. And then it's the occlusal plane, number three, occlusal plane. I can't stress how important that is. The occlusal plane parallel to the ala tragus is the key to beautiful aesthetics. So every, people naturally worry like Jimmy McGill, this is normal. When treating class two patients with a large overjet and competent lips, does this affect stability? I seriously, I don't find it does. It's, it's crucial though to get centric relation. That's the, absolutely the key. We want to have bilateral contacts on that upper denture simultaneously together. So, Stefan Miladinov, how do you keep the denture in whilst doing the trying? I cut a post down on the wax rim and the trying too. So it's all adapted really well. So the trying is fits. This is a wax trying there. It fits around the model perfectly in exactly the same way as the final denture. So it will, it's got a good seal. But during the video, the patient has a glass of cold water and they constantly sip it um, to keep that the wax together. And I just say to them, please don't bite hard on that either. Um, Timesh Carson, have you ever prescribed a lingualized or monoplane occlusal scheme? And what is your indications for using them? So I did my PhD um, looking at, and I did a randomized trial comparing monoplane, lingualized occlusion and anatomic posterior teeth. And we tested, we, I got 50 patients and we randomly allocated that they all got three sets of dentures with these three schemes and they were randomly allocated the different sets and they once they were comfortable they worked with them for two months and then they filled in questionnaires afterwards and what we found was that lingualized occlusion and the anatomic teeth were superior for function and eating and stability and chewing and also the way the patient felt about them they were significantly better than the flat monoplane so what we do is we always make the dentures with anatomic teeth anat because we feel that the anatomic teeth look better we can tip them in at the top there rather than canting them out so i really much prefer um anatomic do, do. someone's asking about post dams Look at the construction manual, it's in there. So that's a good question. Tony Bond's asking a question about um, maintenance of the dentures. So in terms of looking after them when they, so this is really important. It's, um, so for cleaning, what I want them to do is, is to, when they say at night, to take them out and then they brush them with a toothbrush, but using liquid soap, like fairy liquid or the hand wash stuff. And that, so that it preserves the glaze and it doesn't roughen the surface of the denture. So it's actually more hygienic. We don't want to have roughness in it. So bacteria are gonna get in there. So, but they must get right into the nooks and crannies. And because they're quite natural looking, and they're separated, then food gets stuck in. So they may need to use little toothpicks just to clean out between the teeth or even floss. So I need to clean them over a sink with a towel on the top so they don't drop them and bash them on the sink. And then after that, soaking, 
for 20 minutes in hypochlorite solution, which is uh, like Milton, which we use for babies' bottles. So that if that's diluted, one in 20. So one part Milton, 20 part water, 20 minutes. And I advise them to do that whilst they're showering and then take it out and then rinse it. And at night, once they've been cleaned perfectly, just store them in water. Um, so, but I don't, if a patient wants to wear their teeth at night, this is really important. If they, and it's quite often, um, it'll be a woman and she won't like a husband to see um, her without a teeth. She'll be really embarrassed about that. That's fine. I just say, you know, as long as you keep really good hygiene of the denture and do the cleaning when you're having your shower in the morning, you can retain your dignity and keep wear them at night. So that's brilliant. So that's good. So people are, Alexis is under about, everyone obsesses about centric relation and you getting gothic arch and then getting the, the OVD correct. It, it's not, this is really simple. And I, I get the right vertical dimension at visit four, sorry, visit three with my pivots here first, and then I do my gothic arch tracing at that vertical because I've already got articulated models. So I can actually put this onto the articulator, get the pin at the same height as this, and then I can then take off that and then I can adjust the height of this. There's a little screw on here. I can take that up and down and I get that to the same height vertical height as my pivots so it's exactly the same vertical and then record that in CR it's it's really easy dead simple so so Catherine Goff um, Apologies not getting this part. So you essentially perform two wax registrations. So this was for Anne here. Or is this, or is the first just to get the vertical dimension? The first one at visit two made base on the primary cast. The second is with, with the Gothic arch tracing. So, so yeah, the, the primary jaw reg, all it does is it get we get the patient as close to the vertical that we're going to as possible so we get them at the correct vertical which all it does is it means that when rowan makes these the primary jaw edge is to enable me and i'm looking for my gothic arch tracing but here i've put it down somewhere there we go so in order for this to work really well in the mouth the two plates need to be parallel to each other. And if we don't have a primary jaw registration, they can come back like this and just not work. So the primary jaw edge is specifically to get that parallel to each other, to enable it to work properly in the mouth. That's all it is, that primary jaw edge. It's just to do that, and it helps with that. The BPS system uses a different one, which is a centric tray to do that. And I can't use it. I'm rubbish at using the centric tray. Do -do. That's lovely. So Someone's asking about temporary bases. Zika, are you using temporary bases for teeth setup or final processed bases? Um, we use temporary bases uh, because what we find is that 
the if we've got a permanent base on here before we've actually done a, a setup there there's often it's often very very thin through here so can you see how that's six there particularly if we've carved the occlusal plane parallel to the aletragus which looks great they're often quite thin at the top there so i find that having a definitive base is really tricky you know, so you know some people say you get a definitive base with a wax rim so that's like a process base if i ever do use that if i trim it i often go right through to the plastic at the back there so and it inhibits where i'm going to be putting the two two positions for the aesthetics so that's great i think we're pretty much i'm just going to look at the end that's good So the final question, and then we'll, I'm going to go. So someone's asking about what material do I put into the fitting surface here when I'm actually fitting it to check for pressure at the fit appointment. This is a very light bodied silicone impression material, just like you'd use for doing impressions for crown preparations. And it's the one that I use is Doric Flow. It's a... Um, a Shotlander product, um, light. So it's, that's it. That's great. So I'm going to now put you all. Thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next week. And I hope you all stay safe and well. And thank you very much for joining me. It's great to see you. Bye now.